Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a show that is, at least we intend it to be, a weekly broadcast, and it focuses on what's going on in Beatle news. And my name is Ken Michaels. I'm best known for a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by the writer for Beatles Examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. On today's show, we're going to talk about a new release, which came out on October 9th, John's birthday, along with many other things that seem to come out on October 9th. But we're talking about the restored and um, much improved DVD for the Beatles film, Magical Mystery Tour. This came out as uh, a regular DVD, also on Blu-ray, and there is a deluxe package that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But uh, one of the things that I would like to talk about is just the film itself and what you think about the film now, as this is uh, being released now in 2012. This is a movie that was critically panned back in 1967 when it first came out. And uh, I know that it's been given this reputation through the years as being what was certainly up to that point the biggest blunder <laughs> that the Beatles ever made. And do you think that that still holds true after all these years, or do you think that really the film wasn't that bad at all? And Steve, I want to get your take on that. It, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's hard to watch Magical Mystery Tour, even in, in its improved state, and think that it's that much better. And even Paul admits in the director's commentary that you know, what they were trying to do, they were trying to improvise, they were trying to just play it off the cuff. And, I mean, he basically admits that, you know, a lot of the stuff they did, they really didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of, and, and to me, it still comes across that way. I mean, there are there are kind of cute things about it, and they, and they tried to kind of link it to Monty Python, to, you know, and and to kind of uh, say it's a pioneering comedic thing. There's the the uh, interesting you know segment with Victor Spinetti, um, right? But for me personally, even and I will say that it looks a whole lot better than previous versions, and it sounds a whole lot better. I think, in fact, the sound I think is really a huge, huge improvement thanks to Giles Martin. But the film itself. Um, I'm not sure that this is, is going to raise the bar as far as... I mean, it's, it's not never going to be a hard day's night. It's never going to be help. But why um, should it be? I mean, it was a no. different concept from the very beginning. Right. You're dealing, I mean, with, whole, you're dealing with two films there that were scripted to begin with, Help and A Hard Day's Night, and this was total improvisation. So it really right. shouldn't be looked upon in, in the same way. But I think everybody expected something of the Beatles then and, and even now that when they, I mean, look at Let It Be, for example. Let It Be was was not really, I guess what you'd call scripted either. And that has a whole lot more structure to it. And it has a whole lot more meaning, I think you could even say, you know, given what, not only given what happened on the film, but, you know, in terms of their relationships with each other, but given, you know, the whole story of the film. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I, I will say that it's nicer to be able to watch Magical Mystery Tour in its improved state, to see thing, there are things you can see in this print that you can't see in the, in, the, um, in the blurry versions that have, you know, come in the past, the, you know, the import, the import DVDs and all that stuff that have been floating around mm -hmm. that have been readily available um, and like I said, the sound is much, much improved. And if for nothing else, if you're going to get this, the sound is just tremendous. But I don't, I honestly can't say I really think the film is that improved. I mean, there are some funny things. The, you know, the uh, double entendres come across a lot, um, a lot sharper when Wendy Winters goes, um, if there's anything I can do. And you see the faces of everybody kind of, uh, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of snicker. You know what she's talking about, and you know what they're referring to. Right. Um, and the, you know, the um, the outtakes, uh, especially the Bonzo Dog outtake. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's a whole lot of there. There is stuff in there that is interesting, but the film itself, 
Um, I, you know, I really can't see it ra- being raised that much. I really can't. I got to tell you, from my perspective, I have a totally different point of view, and I'm kind of surprised that I'm even saying this because Magical Mystery Tour is not a film that I've watched with any kind of regularity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, A Hard Day's Night and Help have been constants in my life. I right. always pull it out on DVD and even back when they were on video cassette. And the fact that they're on VH1 Classic once in a while, more A Hard Day's Night than Help. But whenever they're on television, I kind of make it an event at home and I watch it anyway, even if I've seen it a thousand times already. But Magical Mystery Tour, I don't think I've seen this film. It's at least five years. It could be up to ten years. And when I watch it this time, I always remember thinking originally, what a weird film this is. When I watch it now, when I've just started watching it for the first time in a long time, I don't think this film is all that strange at all. I mean, I, I, I've grown to appreciate the fact that the Beatles, in general, when they were together, everything was about change. And you mm-hmm. can say that about the music from album to album. There were more drastic changes on certain albums, like, you know, Help to Rubber Soul to Revolver to Sgt. Pepper. Maybe not the early stuff, there were drastic changes, but there was a constant improvement, a constant growth. The thing about the Beatles films, and there are five of them, that I really appreciate now more than ever is that they're all so completely different from each other. And Mm -hmm. the fact that Help and Hard Day's Night were very innovative for its time. There's a lot that I love about those two films. I would never go as far as to call them mainstream, but they were certainly much more structured. There was a plot to those films, albeit a thin plot. But, you know, the filming, the cinematography on both those early Beale movies were tremendous. Here you've got something that's totally spontaneous, totally improvisation. Get to see what the Beatles would do on the spot with their own ideas. And I enjoy it for that reason. I'm not saying that this is a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but when you see some of the things, like a lot of the dream sequences, I know with with John, and I think George said it in the um, the making of, which is one of the bonus features. I think George said his favorite moment was the whole dream sequence in the restaurant where John is uh, using a, a um, what is it, a pitchfork, or he's shoveling the uh, the spaghetti, on, the spaghetti. you know, yeah. that kind of thing. That was all John's idea, and it's just kind of interesting to watch. I happen to think that, and I remember back in the days when when MTV really exploded and it was the primary vehicle to promote new music but they were starting to show a lot of clips from help on a hard day's night as individual videos and they worked very well in that context they weren't made for that reason but when you take apart you know individual songs and what they were doing in those two movies they really work as videos to themselves and at the very least Magical Mystery Tour works extremely well as being a string of videos for the songs. I do think that the the songs, the videos that were made, I really shouldn't call them videos, but whatever was filmed while the songs were playing are really, I think they're very well done. I think Fool on, the- Fool on the Hill, to me, is breathtaking. The actual mm-hmm. scenery of where Paul was, which I believe was in Nice when that he was said, done. Yeah, he's- he says, in, he says in the director's cut, it was, Fran- it was uh, I believe it was the south of France. Um, right. But, um, and I, I will gr- agree with you completely that the videos, the music videos are, are tremendous, and they are really what stra- what holds the film together. Um, I Am the Walrus, of course, has, you know, has been one of those things that anytime you, you know, I, I, almost anytime you see something from that film, that's what you see because it's such a great moment right. um, in, the, in the film. But, and also, um, you know, when Paul has defended this, this movie in the past, what he's always said was, it's the only way you can get to see us do I Am the Walrus. So just for that reason alone, I think it's, it's uh, you know, worthwhile investigating this film or picking up the DVD. But for the individual videos, I found them to be really enjoyable. I love to see Blue Jay Way. I liked uh, what they had shown in, in the film for Flying which I found to be really interesting. And also what was said in the, um, when Paul is giving his commentary, as, as one of the bonus uh, tracks on the DVD, for flying, they were looking for s- some kind of scenery of, you know, 
it actually looks like you know, you're looking at a planet or the moon or something, but it was actually taken as, mm-hmm. as uh, it was an outtake, Paul said, from Dr. Strangelove. Right. And that I found to be really fascinating. But when you look at it now and, and the, the contrast and the colors and how sharp they are, I think I find it really interesting. Yeah, uh, and I agree. Like I said, you know, the videos of the of the songs really hold that thing together. I think some of the other stuff, you know, you kind of have to look at and you go, mm, okay. Especially near the end of the film, where where they where they go into the the you know the, mag- the magician's um, headquarters there, and and they're all and Ringo goes, uh, you know, asks about uh, where's the bus and stuff. You know, right. I just kind of that's. You know, the the improvisation really kind of falls off as far as I'm concerned. But I agree, you know, I mean, you can't help but notice the videos and how good they are. I mean, they they are the, the best part of the film. There's no question. Hmm. Well, you know, I still enjoy just seeing what the Beatles can do when it's total improv, whether it's strong or not. Just this, the fact that this is an example of it. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what they could come up with. And... Do you think that there is any kind of revisionism? Do you, do you see it as we're trying to present this film as though it was ahead of its time? Do you do you think that the uh, the film is being presented that way now? Yes, uh, to a certain extent, I think it is, and I think that's part of the reason why they brought it out again. And in fact, the some of the material I can't remember if it's, if it's uh, I believe it's in, it's in the book in the deluxe edition, and in and in some of the publicity materials drew parallels between Magical Mystery Tour and Monty Python and, and that kind of thing. And, well, you know, and, so I can see that. Because, first of all, the Beatles were very influenced by the goons and Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan. So were Monty Python. And there are times when I'll watch something that Monty Python has done and think, well, that's uh, I could see the Beatles doing that. Or certain things in Beatle movies that I could see Monty Python doing later. I think it's all related. I really do. And the fact that so much of what Mighty Python did, a lot of that was improvisation. You know, when you watch this film now, I just don't find it to be so shocking. And maybe it's because I've been exposed to so much of this improv or whatever you want to call it, cinema verite, a lot of this unscripted stuff. I just find this to be, you know, very easy for me to take in now. Maybe. Well, we're in a different we're in a different time and place too. Right. I mean, in in nineteen, you know, and when when the when the film came out, uh, not only was it different in several respects in comedy respects, but it was also very it was very unexpected that the Beatles would do it. And uh, you know, I I don't think the the film if you're going to compare it to Monty Python, the the thing is that the Beatles are not Monty Python, even. As talented as they are, the Beatles were not, I don't think, the comedic talents that Monty Python are. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I don't think, you know, I think the comparison, as, uh, even, even on a small scale, doesn't entirely measure up. Um, right. I mean, I, I mean, they were very funny. Look at the press conferences. A Hard Day's Night, although that was scripted, was hilarious in, in spots. I mean, there were just there were moments. There were some brilliant moments in there. Uh, my favorite scene that I could watch, I could never get tired of, is the train scene. Okay, uh, I, but I, I uh, think it's I think it's unfair to make a comparison to those movies, because you're dealing with a completely different concept. When you're dealing with complete improvisation, you can't compare that to something that's scripted. Mm-hmm. At, at least as no, far I, as I'm concerned, you know, I, and. Don't get me wrong, A Hard Day's Night and Help, I think, were brilliant films. I love them. I love them to death. But I just found myself enjoying Magical Mystery Tour so much more now, and I just didn't find it to be so shocking as I did. You know, and not only that, but reading Beatle history, and like I said earlier in, in this show, you always heard that this was the Beatles' biggest blunder, or certainly up to that point. Nobody was ever expecting the Beatles to ever fail at anything. And this was the first time that ever happened. They got really slammed in the British press when it was shown on BBC television on Boxing Day. They got horrible reviews. And nobody expected that, certainly coming after Sgt. Pepper. Something as brilliant as Sgt. Pepper. So, you know, the timing of it, you know, I think that it really reflected what was going on at that time in terms of film work, in terms of experimentation. I'm not saying that this is a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but I just appreciate it so much more now 
because it was something different. And why should the Beatles do A Hard Day's Night 2, 3, and 4? They never kept doing the same thing over and over again. No, that's, that's, that's entirely true. And in fact, Paul makes reference to the, to the critics um, at the end of the director's commentary. And he said he actually thanks them kind of sarcastically um, for the bad reviews, which is, which is kind of amusing in itself. Uh-huh. Um, but, um, you know... I'm and actually, his, his opinion of the movie has changed because when it first came out, he even said to the critics, we goofed. He said that around that time. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing wrong with changing your opinion later or appreciating something so much more later than you did originally. And that's... But is he, is he doing it now to sell the movie or to... Or, or because he actually believes that. I think and he actually believes it. Because, you know, if you notice, as opposed to his involvement versus Ringo's, Paul is very much, you know, Paul took the time to do the director's commentary. There's a whole bunch of extra stuff that features him. There's hmm. very little There's very little that features Ringo. There's that, you know, Ringo the actor thing. There's the clips of, uh, little clips of Ringo looking at uh, the Jesse Robbins um, clip. Right. Um, I don't know if you could compare this to Let It Be Naked, which was basically Paul's idea anyway, but the clues seem to lead that way as far as I'm concerned. I don't, I don't buy was, it. You know, first of all, I just want to say something. It's interesting that you brought up Let It Be Naked because when that CD came out, I always remember there's a DJ from New York, I don't want to mention his name, who called it revisionism, and this is Paul trying to revise history, and I don't see it that way at all. Because Let It Be Naked was just another way of listening to the music and how the Beatles originally intended for it to be without the Phil Spector production. You know, it's revisionism if you remove Let It Be, the CD, the regular CD from the catalog, and you never can buy it again, and the only thing you can buy is Let It Be Naked. That's, being, that's revising history. But having a different opinion about something that you did before, it, I don't consider that revisionism there. Well, I, I had, had not to get too far off the subject, but I thought the same thing. But in time, I've grown to really, really like Let It Be Naked because of what it is on its own, uh-huh. not because of the contrast with, with the original Let It Be. I think the the uh, the remixing is a they did a great job with the remixing. It sounds wonderful, and right. I really I I really like it. So, for whatever that you know whatever that uh, means, but. Um, you know, as far as getting back to, to Magical Mystery Tour, I think there's definitely some a marketing thing going on here. And, uh, you know, he's tr- they're trying to, I mean, Magical Mystery Tour never got uh, as good a you know point in Beatle history as perhaps they would have liked it to. And mm. I think this is this is a, a move to correct that. I, now, I have to say, I did not go to the big screen showings this time around. I have seen it. Uh, I saw it on the big screen years ago. And it has, you know, a, a different effect seeing it on the big screen. But it wasn't made for the big screen to begin with. It right. Was made for tele- it was made for television. And um, so, you know, I mean, I don't know if that, that really doesn't mean anything about anything, actually. Think do, about do you think it. that I mean, the... Wait, wait, wait. I just want to comment on what you just said, because when it was shown on BBC television, it was shown in black and white. Right. So that may have had a lot to do with... The criticism that it received, they, they may have appreciated a little bit more if it was in color. Mm-hmm. So, and in fact, one of the interesting things that I found in the deluxe box set, because there's a, a booklet in there which I think is absolutely wonderful. It tells the whole story of how the film was made. It gives you a schedule in there of what they were doing day by day, and there were even um, quotes from the different media and how they responded to the film especially right. the British press. And there was actually in there, there was uh, an old woman who wrote in who said that she wasn't even a Beatle fan or didn't really follow the Beatles, and she watched the film and she loved it. Right. You know, so there are different opinions, and there's always going to be different opinions, and that's the great thing about all art. To some people, I've read some comments online on Facebook, some people saying it was a crappy film then, it's a crappy film now. Some people, you can't change their opinion no matter how you try. But I'm just saying, in, in my particular case, because I always thought this was really too weird a film for me, and I didn't think it, I thought it was just very inconsistent. Watching it now, I, I really appreciate it so much more than I ever have. And I'm not saying that this is of the level of A Hard Day's Night, but I do think on its own merits, as improvisation, it's a very interesting film to see 
Although the argument could always be made that people will say that, well, you know, you're just saying that because it's the Beatles and you find the Beatles fascinating. <laughs> Let's face it. I mean, any kind of footage of the Beatles that we'd never seen before or stuff that, in the case of Magical Mystery Tours, certainly hasn't been examined as much. Anything that we see of them interacting with each other is fascinating. Right. So right. you are somewhat biased going into this, but I still found it to be an enjoyable film when you consider the music that was in there, what was filmed for the music, and what happened in between. And I also found it really interesting when you, when you look at all the bonus stuff on the, the DVD, the stuff that was deleted. Because one thing that I did notice when I watched it now is that it seemed to end at the right moment. Mm -hmm. It didn't drag. I mean, this, this film goes on for, I forget the exact time, I think it's like 55 minutes, something like that. Right. But if it had gone lo a little bit longer, if they had put this other stuff in there, there are some uh, scenes, uh, Nat's Dream, for example, or there's a scene with Ivor Cutler in there going over to, uh, I think it's an organ, some kind of right. piano in the field. I, that, no, that, I, I, I like that Ivor Cutler scene. I thought that was a great scene, and I was really actually surprised that that didn't make it. I said, I, the Nat Stream is, 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 Nat Stream isn't bad either, but the Ivor Cutler scene I thought was great. I really did. You think that would have uh, added to the film? I thought the, the music, that song was a great song. And I thought, yeah, I think it would have, I think it would have fit in nicely with, I mean, considering the stuff that they left in with Jesse Robbins, you know, singing, uh, and uh, you know, and some of the other stuff. Yeah, I think that would have been uh, that would have been fine. I really do. And then you know, the the romance scene with with uh, that was um, nice. Buster Blood Vessel know. and Aunt Jessie. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, considering some of the stuff that I think that would have, it's difficult to say that certain things would have would not have worked. And I and I think that Ivor Cutler scene would have worked very nicely. I think the song says a lot about him. Remember, Cutler was a was a well known was a performer outside of Magical Mystery Tour, right? And he had you no. Know, so I, I think that said a, a lot about him. I think the the traffic scene did not belong. Okay, here we go yeah, around the that, mulberry bush. Right, that didn't that didn't belong. That's kind of interesting, that, though, that the Beatles approached them to submit right. something for the film. Yeah, it was, and actually, I, I believe that particular clip was the basis of their own movie because they did a movie their own themselves. Actually they've done they did a couple of movies. There's another movie that they that they did on D V D uh that's out on D V D that is lesser known and it's kinda closer to a hard day's night. But uh, this one uh, I I have to admit I haven't seen Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush but uh It's a but, very good uh, video. It's very typical of its time. And that right. for people who are, are listening and don't know what we're talking about, there's an actual video that the band Traffic made and it was uh, the Beatles had asked them to submit something, uh, and that was, I think, a hit for them at the time. Here we go around the Mulberry Bush, one of their songs. And so that was something for consideration for the film, and that's a bonus track on the DVD. i got to tell you that I'm really impressed with all these bonus tracks that you get on the DVD. Um, Are you? Yes. I mean, there's, there's so much that, I mean, they really make it worth your while just to get the DVD. I mean, there is the audio, the, the audio commentary from Paul as he's watching the film, which is interesting. Sometimes I think it went a little bit too long, but it's almost like you're in a movie theater sitting next to Paul and he's talking to you about the stuff as it's happening. And well, I, I think the, I think that audio commentary is great. I really do. He he explains. He goes a long way into explaining in depth what the, what they were thinking, and I think and his thoughts on some of that stuff is is really really good. Um, you know, I uh, I love the part where he he talks about John. Playing with um, Nicola, uh, you know, and 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 um, actually, it's it's Nicola. <laughs> oh, Nicola. <laughs> That's the way you pronounce okay. it. I always said it was little Nicola. I didn't know. Um, you know, talking about uh, playing with her and, and uh, uh, showing his soft side, and I thought that was very. I thought that was very interesting. Right. And he also makes comments about the Paul is dead thing, which is which is also kind of amusing, you know, to him to, talking about that, you know, and um, because of the, the whole, black coronation bit mm -hmm. on your mother yeah. should know that's why i brought it up yeah. right right there's a whole lot of stuff in that commentary that is really 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 good um talking about victor spinetti uh -huh. um talking about bonzo dog band i mean every there's that really is is uh that director's commentary is great i only wish ringo had gotten in there with him mm. um, it would have been nice to hear ringo also talk about things and 
Um, Ringo didn't say nearly enough, but he, he did show. Yeah, he, yeah. he doesn't have a whole lot of a, a whole big role on that DVD at all. Like I pointed out earlier, and I thought that was kind of. I wish he had done a little more. Right, but. But you know but, what else I really loved about uh, the bonus tracks were the the alternate takes for uh, Blue Jay Way, which I found to be really fascinating. <laughs> Some of what was done visually in that in that particular video, I thought was really interesting. You I know? did. You know, I, I now I'm going to hit you with a and a, Fool a, on the Hill bit. too. You know, Fool on the Hill I thought was wonderful. Yeah, I thought Blue Jay Way was okay. Uh, the 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 footage didn't link up as well as Fool on the Hill. The one I really did not like was Hello Goodbye. And I well, was that was really interesting because had, had you ever seen that before? No, I had not. Um, but there, it really, there was so much of so much footage of people that weren't the Beatles right. in there. And I would have really liked the fact that it's not in the movie. Why didn't they put the original video in there? I mean, that would have been, and, and put that also put in the added video. Well, I there were several videos been. made for Hello Goodbye. But the right, mere I mean, fact that this one, I, I've never seen it before. You know, no, I, know. I just didn't know that it even existed. But well, for, I, pe- for people I, that don't know, there was a video that was made for Hello Goodbye. It was in celebration of the fact that it had hit number one. And it's actually in black and white. And you see the Beatles in a, in a film studio where they're looking at uh, the actual film tape. It's, I, I think it's an editing room, actually. Right. And then they, they intercut that with this couple, two couples, and they're in front of a house and you see snow outside and you they pop in and out and I don't know what that had to do with the song <laughs> but the fact that it was even made and you know it's it's hardly known at all I, I thought that was really fascinating that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm not real real gung ho with that one uh, there you know there's so many questions who who who's the couple what's going on here you know what does it mean I I just you know, I wish they had at least put the original, or one of the original, or maybe all the original videos on on there. Uh-huh. You know, because everybody loves that particular video is probably a a big favorite among the fans. And you know, I think that would have, I think that belonged there, especially since it isn't in the movie, and it, it, since it's at, there's a clip of the song at the end. I think that belonged, you know, on the DVD. And I'm sorry that they didn't, you know, deem it. Uh, necessary hmm. but they're saving and, that for the video compilation yeah that's, <laughs> and actually i'm starting to think that that they are leading to that and uh it, it's beginning to look like that i know that's one thing that if you were to take a survey i think that's probably high on the list and i think that's i think they're starting to think like that although god only knows when they would do, when they'll do it but who knows but uh, overall, I'm just very impressed with the DVD. I mean, I really think they, they packed it with so much extra stuff, and it made it worth your while to pick it, up the it, DVD. It really did. If you look at the, um, the for those of you that have Blu-ray, um, there is, a, there is a, a definite improvement with the Blu-ray over the regular DVD um, if you're looking to decide which way to go. It's unfortunate, however, that the only way to get both is to buy the deluxe. There's no combo packs, and I think that was a... I wish they had done that, um, you know, for the sake of people that would want copies of both. Right. But they did not. But very quickly, on the deluxe box set, what did you think of it? The packaging and all. I liked, I liked it. It was very, It's very nice. In fact, I'm sitting here holding the thing um, while we're talking, and uh, I liked it. Uh, what really got me was the vinyl EP. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people have not seen those, I'm sure, unless you were around in you know, in '67 when when they were originally uh, released. I know that for a, for a while they were very readily available because that's all that Parlophone did until they decided to go with the the complete um, when they picked up what Capital did. Um, for you know, they decided what Capital did was a good idea, and they they copied it. Right. But for a long time, the EP was the only thing that was available from you know as the English release. And it's great to be able to not only to have one in hand, but to, you know to to see what it looked like. I mean, that was I'm glad they added that in. I really am. Yeah, I'm most um, impressed with the booklet that came with the deluxe box, 
because it, it takes you through the whole history of of the mm-hmm. film and uh, it gives you a schedule in there of what they were doing day by day, where they were filming. And also, and they did this on the DVD as well, they actually show a lot of respect for the cast members. And they give you a little bit of background on each one. And you might think, well, you know, a lot of these actors didn't say all that much or do all that much in the film. But still, they acknowledge them. <laughs> if you right. want to know more about Ivor Cutler, it's in there. They even they even uh, name the stripper. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just about anything you'd ever want to know about the cast members, you can find on the DVD and in this booklet. And even uh, as I said before, some of the reviews that came out from the BBC and the British press, and uh, how they varied too, mainly negative. There was one very interesting thing that I found in there that Barry Miles had sa- had said um, that he felt that the British press in general, were very unkind to the Beatles and were very critical of them after they stopped touring. You know, that they were like, you know, once they became a recording band or something, they they just had a different view of them. You know, they were very critical of them. So I found that interesting. And, uh, you know, that could be part of the reason why they got the bad press that they did. Part of it for Magical Mystery Tour. Who knows? That's from his perspective. Right. It's too bad uh, that they did not use the full um, making a magical mystery tour that they showed on uh, on the BBC um, recently, the full hour thing. But you know, I suspect that the BBC had first did, dibs on that. But um, do you know what was in there that's not in the film? It's the film is online. I had have not seen it, so there may have been some additional interviews and things that they that they grabbed. Um, but um, I no, I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know about that. You're right about the book, though. The book is a, is a great, is really well done. I wish the book had been hardcover, um, mm-hmm. to not to get nitpicky. And I, I'm noticing here that uh, at one point the Beatles made Magical Mystery Tour available for uh, screenings in universities. You know, kind of a, a prelude to the uh, Wings Tour. Um, <laughs> Which is kind of which is kind of curious, but yeah, the, the book is the book is really nice, and and actually, it would be a really good thing. You know, it's too bad that they did not put uh, a book, not necessarily this book, but a book out separately. I think that would have been a good idea, and maybe who, who knows, maybe they'll do that at some point. But um, and they do give uh, you an actual uh, bus ticket. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of that was kind of amusing. Yeah, uh, that they that they did that, but but. Um, the the benefits to the deluxe set are the book, the vinyl EP, which you know for for EP or vinyl collectors is a good deal, and the uh, combo pack where you get both the DVD and the uh, Blu-ray. And there's nothing on the uh, on those DVDs that isn't on the the regular versions. Right. So. But, See, that's um, the thing. I think that's kind of like, do you really have to have both the DVD and the Blu-ray? But some people have a Blu-ray and some people don't. So to make it easier to have one uniform package, they put both on there so that they're covered. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, uh, you know. But if you, if, for example, if you're traveling, since there's no um, uh, downloads on this thing, uh, there's no download tickets. Um, you know, you can take one with you and leave one at home. Um, <laughs> I guess. But, I guess. But. Um, the film, the the old version is still online, is you know is around online if you if you know where to look, but um, all in all, I mean, like I said, I, you know, I don't think that the the release will you know boost the status of Magical Mystery Tour a whole lot. I'm glad that they finally done it though because it's kind of been the the kind of uh, a bad stepchild know of Beatles films that you know that they've kind of ignored all these years and and uh, it's about time that uh, I'm glad that they finally brought Yellow Submarine back into print which they should have a long time ago right. and this is something that that definitely should have been brought back into print too now hopefully maybe this is pointing to let it be is coming well I um, definitely think that with the fact that Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour came out this year you know, everything else has been done except that. And I can't believe, no matter all the arguments that we've heard, that it won't come out. I just, I can't believe that it won't. 
I mean, a lot of work has been done on Let It Be. And even going back to watching the Beatles anthology, the print of Let It Be in the Beatles anthology was amazing. And even that, we're talking about you know, 1995, right. 1994, that, that whole period right there. That was right. then. You know, it's almost 20 years later. Yep. Imagine, you know, it could be even better looking than that. Yeah. So yep. they wouldn't do all that work on Let It Be and just not do anything with it. It's got to come out. I can't, I can't believe that either. I can't believe that either. And they've got tons of outtakes, so it's going to be exciting when it happens. But um, I certainly appreciate Magical Mystery Tour more now than I have before. I just don't believe in making comparisons to the other Beatle movies because they're different concepts altogether. You know, it's like, do you compare Magical Mystery Tour to Yellow Submarine? You know, one's an animated film. One is a totally improv film, very spontaneous, making up stuff on the spot or coming up with ideas and just, you know, experimenting. It was very right. free form, and I like it for that reason. You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't have to be something so structured as A Hard Day's Night and Help to appreciate it. I like this other side of the Beatles. And no, you can say the same true. thing about music. I mean, Revolution Number 9 was extremely experimental for its time. I would never knock the Beatles for trying that or John for doing that. So this is something more experimental when it comes to film and something yeah. representative of its time. And uh, I don't think that we should be making comparisons. I think you should try to watch this on its own merits. And certainly, as I, I mean, said before, as a string of videos, it certainly works well. I mean, Fool on the Hill and I Am the Walrus are really amazing videos to me. So, right. uh, and I like I'm Your Mother Should Know, too. It's a little bit corny, but I like seeing the Beatles going down the, the staircase in the white tuxedos and all of it. Yeah, and and the and the, you know the, and you got the you got the uh, you got the outtakes to to look at. And there's there's a whole bunch of stuff here. So I think anybody that you know at the at the least you're going to want to buy you know one of the regular DVD, either the regular or the Blu-ray, Blu-ray by itself. Right. At the least, just for the for the all the extra stuff. Um, whether you decide to to go for the deluxe is you know of course uh, up to you. And and I wouldn't be surprised if sometime down the road maybe the the deluxe versions kind of drop in price a little bit like the help version did but um they're fun what can i say i mean they're the, it's the beatles we would have we would have bought it anyway <laughs> but i honestly so, think that uh, as a work of art it's interesting to watch not just because it's the beatles i do like the film work that's done in it it's very it's very um as i said it's kind of wacky it's it's experimental i like seeing that side to balance with everything else that the beatles did so okay. that puts a wrap on this show. I don't think Steve agrees with me. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can do so on our Facebook page for things we said today. And each of us has our own individual Facebook pages. Steve has one. What, what's I have a I have a bunch of them. I have ones for each of the pages, but if but the one I mainly hook into is the is my personal page. So okay. come by there and and friend me and say hello and and. And tell me what you think of the show, and, and also post your opinions on the on the uh, things we said today page. And we'd love to hear from you. We want to know what you think, and we want to get engage in dialogue with you. And uh, if you want to know more about the other work that I do with my syndicated show called Every Little Thing, or learn more about my history and sample some of my other work connected with the Beatles, lots of interviews in particular, and uh, trivia too. If you want to delve into that, you can check out my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And you can catch up with me on Beatles on Examiner.com and look for Beatles Examiner. And and uh, I have uh, um, I post uh, headlines from my stories on on the Facebook page. So and on Twitter, I'm also on Twitter. Okay, we're all over the place. So if we're you all... can, please try to get in touch with us. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels, along with Steve Marinucci, saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.